founder and CEO of uh, Diamond Kinetics, and uh, super excited to have uh, Matt Clement joining us tonight to uh, talk a little baseball, a little basketball, uh, some pitching. So uh, Matt's joining in here. There he is. Hey, Matt. Hey, how what's you going doing? on, CJ? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing great, man. Hey, listen, uh, thanks for uh, coming along and spending a little time with us tonight. No problem. My pleasure. So uh, for everybody that's just joining now, I'm, I'm CJ Handron. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Diamond Kinetics. Uh, really thrilled tonight to have uh, one of our advisors. And uh, I got I got I to gotta rattle some of the bio off here for you. Um, you know, Matt Clement with us tonight, um, nine-year Big leaguer, uh, played with Padres, Marlins, Cubs, and Red Sox, uh, pitched over 1,400 innings in the big leagues, uh, all-star in 2005. And then, you know, at least from my perspective, uh, equally as, as awesome is that has, you know, spent the last 11 years as a uh, very, very successful high school basketball coach at his alma mater uh, here and actually in the, in the Pittsburgh area, Butler, PA. So this one's really going to be a lot of fun tonight. Uh, we're we're going to mix it up. We're going to talk a little basketball. We're going to talk baseball. We're going to talk pitching, technology, the big leagues, and kind of everything in between. So I, I'd encourage anybody, uh, you know, a ask us some questions. We'll try to work in as many as we can down there with the, the question box um, and and thrilled to have everybody with us tonight. So, so Matt, maybe we'll jump in here, man. Um, you know, we're, we're, uh, you're in your house. I'm in my house. We're, we're all in our, in our, our home-based worlds right now. So, you know, maybe let's start there. You know, what's, uh, what have you been up to? Um, you know, what, what's, what's the family doing? How's, how's life at home and, and what are you doing to kind of pass the time with everything that's going on right now? Well, we're adapting the best we can, like everybody is right now. And, um, a lot of school work in the morning and a lot of working out in the afternoon. And, and then that usually turns into a lot of video games at night and uh, <laughs> kind of have a good routine going, uh, having three boys uh, all play two sports. And then a daughter who is uh, a gymnast that spends as much time on her one sport as they do on the two. Uh, we have a lot <laughs> going on during the day. So a lot, a lot of uh, my arms in pretty good shape from throwing batting practice and uh, <laughs> long tossing and, uh, um, I'm, I'm not as good as I once was, as the song goes. Uh, I'm, I'm struggling <laughs> a little bit with my trying to keep up with my sons and the workouts and different things. But it's been a lot of fun from that perspective. And we're, we're making the best out of what we can. That's awesome. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to come back around to some of that because I think uh, it's, it, I, I want to hear about, you know, some of the things that you have this unique perspective, right? So you, you have the perspective of you know, your, your career, your playing career. Uh, but now you also have the perspective uh, as, as a dad of, of kids playing, you know, multiple different sports, but, but certainly uh, a couple of your boys playing baseball. And so we'll, we'll come back around to that a little bit. Um, you know, I, I love your backstory, you know, I, I love it. And I want to spend a little time, maybe you can share with us, you know, just kind of take us back. Cause you know, we're, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of, a, you're a basketball and a baseball guy, right? So if we go back to high school and, you know, you've shared with, with me and, and with our team, you know, the, the run up to actually kind of, you know, ending up getting drafted and, and, you know, the, the baseball piece of this may be coming a little bit later on in high school. So kind of take us through that, you know, like take us through the background from, uh, you know, uh, uh, you coming up as a player, you know, in high school basketball and kind of into, you know, getting drafted by the Padres. Well, I mean, I, I was a, you know, to put it in perspective, I pitched nine innings my junior year and 18 my senior year. And I think a lot of people think I didn't play baseball and didn't care about baseball during that time. No, that wasn't the case. Uh, you know, at the time, basketball was my, I, I wouldn't say it was my first love, but it was the one I spent more time on. And I love both sports. I wanted to play both sports. Uh, you know, you go through when you're a five foot six ninth grader, uh, sometimes sports get tough in those ages in there and, and you kind of find your way through. And I, I think some, if you, if you can guarantee you're going to grow, that really works to your advantage at the end, because you learn how to play small, you learn how to, to survive when other kids are going through puberty or getting bigger or stronger. So during that time, I didn't pitch because I wasn't one of the bigger guys. I pitched when I was, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13. And, um, and, and then, then it came on later. I had a good arm and all the time I spent training on basketball, I think really helped me strength wise. I got stronger. Um, my legs got stronger and, and I always had a pretty good arm and it all kind of came together. I mean, it, it, it was pretty crazy. I, I didn't have, I had a couple people interested in me going into my senior year based on a film I did in the fall. And 
they were really serious about me, but nobody else was. And I, and I figured out later they were trying to keep it pretty quiet once they, they saw yeah. me on that film. And uh, so, so later on, I pitched a, I actually pitched a uh, baseball game with no scouts, nobody there. Uh, went to the round ball class. I had to leave early to go to the round ball classic uh, at Civic Arena for basketball. And was pretty much set. I was going to try to play basketball in college at, you know, whatever level. I had some Division One interest. I had, you know, some offers from Division One. I. I had Division Two, And I just really wasn't sure what I was going to do. Because, you know, I think one of the time, the differences in times now is back then you didn't, college wasn't what you were worried about in seventh, eighth grade. And, you know, I didn't think about college other than I was going to it until right around Christmas, my senior year. Hmm. And uh, I was a little late to think about it, but then the, the, the sports offers started to come in. And even though I had some interest, that there wasn't, it wasn't number one on my list. And, um, you know, I pitched that game. Uh, the, the next game, I, I, James Madison wanted to come up and see me pitch, and they were coming to see a kid from Franklin Regional pitch, uh, hit the same day. And there was, uh, luckily there were some pro scouts there to see the kid also. And, you know, I threw 92, 93 miles an hour. Next, this was six weeks, less than six weeks before the draft. Uh, next start, I had 60 scouts at it, 60 college <laughs> and pro scouts. Uh, lost the game at Newcastle at Clarity Field, which was kind of came full circle last year when my son played there. And uh, it's the first time I've been there since that, you know, since that day. And, uh, you, you know, after the game, after I lost five to four, I think the score was I got offered six Division One full rides. And back then, Division One baseball full rides were still – as rare as they are now, but it was yeah. close enough to the draft. People were losing their players. It was the spring. And, um, you know, five, six weeks later, I was, I still hadn't decided if I was playing, going to college or playing basketball or what I was going to do. And I got drafted in the third round and kind of, you know, took the Padres advice that said that they're going to develop me. And I was, I was a little worried because I wasn't experienced as a pitcher. I didn't think I was a great pitcher that I needed somebody that I had to trust them to develop me. And they, and they did a great job developing me. It's just awesome, you know, and, and, you know, what I think is so cool, too, is that then the whole thing kind of boomerangs around and comes full circle, right? So you have this amazing career, you know, for almost 10 years in the big leagues and then, you know, kind of coming back to, you know, whether first love or not or they were equal or whatever it might be, you know, and then now spending, you know, doing what you're doing as a basketball coach. So, you know, I actually want to talk about that for a little bit, right, because, you know, you, uh, you've you experienced what, what a lot of people are experiencing in baseball. You've experienced it now in basketball and then also in, in baseball with your sons, right? So, you know, you have a – you had um, – maybe if not your best, one of your best teams this year, you know, won the, the Western Pennsylvania, you know, championship and, and we're making your way through the state playoffs here when everything got abruptly stopped. Uh, you know, so we've, we've talked with others in our chats around, you know, the abrupt stop of baseball seasons, but you know, you, you you're experiencing this as a coach, right. And had to deal with your team and your players. And then also obviously, you know, that, that trans translates down in basketball to your boys. And then also, you know, they've lost their baseball season. So, how did you deal with that, right? And 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 how 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 challenging has that been to go through? What what are your thoughts? Do you have any kind of thoughts to share on on perspective on that? You know, this just what we're all going through this spring and losing seasons. Well, I mean, you got to go by what your words are, and I I always preach to my team, especially this year's team, don't let external factors bother you, and you still got to perform, you still got to be ready to go. And <clears throat> I know that sounds really, you know, coach cliche like, but. It's, it's kind of a, a mantra we, we live by this year. And, um, you know, when that came along, and, and, and that's where we are right now, there's not a whole lot you can do about it. And uh, is it disappointing? Yeah. But, you know, I, I look at it from another perspective. It could have been worse. You know, it could have happened before the Whipple Championship. We, we could have lost the Whipple Championship and left like, oh, we could get the state championship to go with our section championship. And, uh, it, you know, it, unfortunately, we're, we're in a spot that's unprecedented. And you got to make the best of it as far as sports go. And, and you know, uh, uh, a lot of people are sad about it in Butler because when, when I don't know how many people listening or, or who have been involved, have, you know, have seen what, what goes on when Butler is playing basketball, you get the whole town traveling. And um, so there's a lot of people that were disappointed and, and bummed out about it, as was I. You know, this is a one-time chance, potentially. There's, there's not a state title banner in the Butler gym for basketball. <laughs> You know, and that was one of our goals was to create our, our own our own banner to go with it. And um, so, you know, it, 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 but it's a situation that you can't do anything about and you got to make the best of it. And I, I told my team I got to meet with them the Saturday before really the shutdown that happened. The, the school shut down Saturday at noon and my my AD and the school let me meet with my team in the morning. And I told them, I said, 
you know, take this as an opportunity. And, uh, you know, it's what I'm telling my own kids. And it's, it's what I'm telling the, the, the kids at Butler, whether it's basketball, baseball, whatever the case may be. This is an opportunity because a lot of people aren't going to do stuff. And, and, and they might not do stuff because they don't have the equipment and that's too bad or whatever the case may be. But they're not going to put the time in. This is a great time to get ahead of people, whether it be our program as a whole in basketball, whether you be, be you individually uh, amongst the program or you as a player in another sport. This is a great time to get ahead. And, and, and you got to make the best of a tough situation. And unfortunately, you know, we'll always, we'll always wonder what would happen in the state playoffs. We were playing Erie McDowell um, in the final eight. And we, we had been there before with one of my first teams. And Erie McDowell's the team we beat last year. Uh, they're also – it was a coin flip game, in my opinion. I, I think it could have went either way. If we played ten times, it probably would have went five <laughs> and five. So, you know, it wasn't and, – and, and I think the East wasn't – you know, the East didn't have that powerhouse, ridiculous, nationally ranked <laughs> team out of Philadelphia that you couldn't beat. So those things will always linger with us, and we'll always think about yeah. it. could have been that opportunity. But we made so many great memories – and, and a lot of great things happened this year. And, 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 you know, it's a shame that we didn't get to finish it. But at the same time, you go undefeated in, in, the, in our section, which is, doesn't happen very often. And, and win the section, win the whip, you'll play against, you know, four really, three really good teams. Get off to the state championship and, and, and win those first couple games there and leave on a 17-game winning streak. It could be worse. You know, it could yeah. be worse. And, and I, I guess the silver lining, if you want to be a little bit humorous about it is I, I, every we, we won on the on the leap year and every four years that that leap year will be pretty cool that's when we won the whip year and that's awesome i feel like every four years will be like well we got robbed that state championship <laughs> we had it we were the favorite it, you know it'll, it'll be more and more as we go along but it'll be it'll be a, i told the kids it'll be a great talking point at the reunions or whatever yeah. the case may be when we get back together about this we'll never forget this that's a great approach you're taking, you know, right? That take take the as much positive out of it as you can, and and you know you, you brought something up in there, and that's a good, you know, a good transition to. Uh, you you sent a great message to your team, right? It was treat this as an opportunity, right? You have an opportunity to be able to to take advantage of the time, right? So there's the disappointment piece of it, but now you have this time to work on things, and you know, and obviously being as a, an advisor of ours and working closely with our company, you know, you, you know what what we are we've been focused for since this all started with, with our play at home initiative, right. And in ways that we can try to help um, and, and help how technology can help in those situations. Right. So, you know, your, your basketball season's over now, your, your boys play baseball as well. Um, So tell us a little bit about the kinds of things that, that you guys are focused on. Right. So there's opportunity and and I'm sure you feel that same way in, in baseball too. So you talked about throwing BP, you talked about some of the things that you've been doing at home, but tell us a little bit more about, um, how you're approaching this time with your sons, you know, the, the opportunity and some of the things that you're working on. Well, you know, I think when I, you know, to kind of back it up a little bit, when I, when I first got involved with Diamond Kinetics, it, it kind of sparked, you know, I was still interested in baseball, still doing it with my kids, but kind of watching from afar as my kids grew up and, and the technology that you guys brought forth kind of sparked my interest and, and kind of lit the fire underneath me to, to learn more about this. And, and, you know, and then last year, uh, my my uh, one of my sons played for the Spikes, who who the Pittsburgh Spikes travel organization, and and they lit it even more. And you know, I tell people all the time, this is there's a lot of old school, new school baseball and Twitter fighting and all kinds of stuff going on about all this stuff. And and baseball has changed. And, and if and if you don't like it, you're 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 gonna miss out right now. And and you know, the stuff we're we're focused on. We were fortunate, you know, we've been fortunate enough to have the, the Diamond Kinetics information and, and other information and the analytics and also have some coaches that teach you the, the proper way to move to enhance those, the, enhance those readings or to get them to work. And so, so right now we're in the process of it's not always reading what's coming off the bat or throwing the ball. That, that gets mixed in in between to see where we are and see what kind of ground we've made up. It's, it's weight training to get stronger in my legs to be able to produce this. It's a lot of you know, now that I know what's important to pitch or to hit because of these readings we're able to get now, it's working on the, you know, the function of your body and the biomechanics of your body to make it work. And it's become kind of a, a semi-passion of mine with, with, with baseball, with pitching and hitting, to tell you the truth. I think I picked up the hitting end of it even quicker than I did the pitching end of it. And, and I tell people all the time, you know, I, was a, I wasn't a great hitter in the big leagues. I was a good high school hitter. 
a terrible hitter in the big leagues because I was worried about staying. <laughs> Quite frankly, I was worried about I, hitting wasn't going to keep me there. I yeah. wasn't a I wasn't a superstar <laughs> every year. I needed to be able to get people out, and I worried about bunting and not making a fool of myself at the plate and <laughs> and getting people out. So, but but understanding it all now and seeing it all now, it's 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 such a process. And I, I think the tough part, you know, as, as I kind of dive a little bit deeper into this from a youth standpoint, is now you turn on the internet. And you turn on social media or Twitter or Instagram, and there's all kinds of people teaching it. And there's all kinds of things happening. And, and Diamond Kinetics is a company that's providing this, this data, which is unbelievable. And, and I think the process that I'm trying to figure out right now that I've learned over these last couple of years from studying, talking to some of my former teammates that are head, co head pitching coaches in the big leagues now or are part of the Dodgers or Astros organization, which are the two organizations that are really driving – the, uh, the, the biomechanical, analytical, the metric, the saver metric end of baseball right now. The thing that I've, I've learned is, you know, it's the, the, the readings can work a lot of different ways. And I know you want to talk about some of that stuff later on. But the biggest thing is, like, it's getting the readings is one thing, but getting them and being out of control isn't, isn't good enough. So, you know, like, like my passion right now as a coach is how can I help you improve your, your you know, your performance and the numbers at the same time. And I think a lot of this stuff, you have, it, it's really hard right now because, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a world where people are getting offered scholarships because they throw hard or hit the ball hard as freshmen and sophomores. But then the, the time comes when you get to the place and you have to, and you have to, be, able to, you have to be able to perform. And, and so, so there, there's, this, there's this part about, I think, understanding the, the analytics and all this stuff and the way you move and how you improve and how you get this stuff to all tie together. And it's great to have, you know, to be at home, have a Diamond Connects ball or the bat sensor and get the feedback to see how much you're doing it. I think the, the, the caution that I worry about is, okay, you know, I can go out there and throw right now myself as an old man. And, and you know, I might throw 78, 80 miles an hour and, and be pretty decent with it. But if I try to throw 82 to 84 – I'm hitting the top of the cage all over the place. So how can I, how can I get those two to, you know, kind of convulge together and make it work? And I, you know, it's great to have a checkpoint at home because most people can't afford to buy a rap soda or yeah. have a track man or whatever the case may be. And then it's, and then it's just really educating yourself. And I educate myself all the time by going on social media and reading more or asking somebody that I believe in that really knows what they're talking about, about the stuff or sending you know, send in some film and say, okay, is this, is this the best way to improve a spin rate or a vertical bat angle or a launch angle or whatever the case may be? Yep. Yeah. You know, and I think you hit on, on really, really good points in there. Right. And, and as you think about the evolution of technology, right. And I think we're just kind of entering, really entering this phase now, right. There's a period that like, okay, now we are able for the first time ever to get the information. Right. And, and I want to talk in a minute about, you know, you've shared with me some different thoughts along the way of like, man, if I, if this was there when I was playing, like what, what you would have been able to do with it. But now you enter this phase then where, you know, I think people really are understanding like how to apply it. Right. And, and I think that'll be the, that's the next phase. It certainly is for us. I mean, we're, we've, we've begun to, to put together with, with partners like USA baseball instructional content programs that really kind of, help us use the data to then inform what we do, right? We want it to be a guide and you want it to be something that, to your point, like kind of helps you as a checkpoint along the way. So that, that's, that's awesome. Um, you know, talk a little bit, I mean, you know, we um, talk a little bit about that, that idea. You know, I, I feel like I, in the time that, that we've known you, like, you know, you, you had this tremendous curiosity, like right out of the gate. I could tell like it really like perked things up when and this was years ago when, when we first met you. Um, and, and definitely, I think you've said to me along the way, you know, like there's just been these connection points in these light bulbs, right? You know, you're, you're close with Colin McKee, who's, who's another, you know, has come on board as, as a pitching advisor of ours, but, you know, talk a little bit about how, um, you know, you, how, if it was there when you were pitching in the big leagues, what you think would have been different for those that are just joining us. Thanks so much for joining. I'm CJ Handron, the co-founder and CEO of Diamond Kinetics. Uh, my pleasure tonight to have one of our advisors, uh, former nine-year big leaguer Matt Clement joining us uh, talking basketball, baseball, pitching, and kind of everything in between. If you have questions, feel free to, uh, to add them in the, the question box there, and we'll, we'll try to answer as many as we can. 
Uh, but tell us a little bit about your perspective now on, you know, if you felt like if you understood and had spin rate and spin axis and, and some of the, the available information now that, you know, whether it's our ability to provide it, you know, out of a, out of a smart baseball or, you know, the ability at the big league level to, to capture it on the field, what, what, what do you think would have been different? Well, and, and I want to back up one second, you know, when you brought up Colin McKee, and I, and I think I saw firsthand what this, what, the biomechanics and the, and the analytics and the readings and the metrics and everything can do for somebody. You know, I saw him come out of Mercyhurst. I watched him go through high school. He wasn't like always the best pitcher on our team in, in the Butler high school, went to Mercyhurst was the PSAC pit, pitcher of the year, his junior year got drafted by the Astros. And one thing I remember is when he came back and, I, and he got hurt that first year and he was a sinker baller. He was a two seam sinker baller. And, and they, they basically got rid of his sinker. Uh, went to four seam and I didn't understand it, but it piqued my interest. And the next year when I followed him, he, all of a sudden he's throwing 93, 94 from 89 to 91. And, you know, I actually had him come out and talk to my son and, and go through some of the stuff he was doing. And he explained it to me. And this all kind of, it was, it was part of those light bulbs that went off at the <laughs> same time, you, you know, and I remember saying right then when I had him, if I would have had this, because, you know, I, I was, I was able to survive as a big league player by working hard. I wasn't a, a, you know, obviously I wasn't a natural talent. I got, I got discovered late. I had to figure out how to pitch because I didn't pitch much in high school and I really wasn't a pitcher. I was a basketball player. And so, but, but I, but I spent a lot of time, you know, I spent seven, eight hours a day in the off season trying to figure things out and all this time before the game doing, working on this stuff. So if I would have had this, I, I say it all the time. It probably comes up once every couple of weeks. When I'm talking baseball with somebody. If I would have had this stuff at my disposal, I would have done what Colin has done. I guess why I give him so much credit. And that's why I'm such a big fan. Other than the fact that he, he's just a great person and, and a great role model for my sons and for kids in Butler and in general, but, but he's, he's taking this data. He's used it instead of saying, you know, and I, I can't even say I wouldn't have when the dog, when the Astros said, get rid of my best pitch and go to this. Cause I actually remember saying to him, they're crazy. And, and instead of doing that, he, he dove into it. He's a very intelligent kid and and figured it out and learned from it and, and saw it firsthand and I start thinking to myself now like I understand there's stuff that when I'm helping kids that are in college or some I, I kind of try to help some of the college kids from around the area as a mentor as a psychologist whatever the case may be somebody that's been through it when I'm helping them and they send me film now because I feel a little bit more confident to watch the film and see what they're doing and, and help break it down a little bit or at least send it off to people that are even smarter than me at it you know, I see it and I think to myself, my, I didn't do this. You know, I survived and I got through it, but maybe my shoulder doesn't blow up when it did. Maybe my fastball is better. Maybe my commands, better. I know it would be because I can tell when I play catch, when I play catch with my sons, I kind of start to do some of the arm pass stuff. Some of the throwing through my back heel and all the different things that help, help generate all these numbers that make you successful. So seeing how Collins used it kind of, you know, I'm, I'm so proud of him and happy for him. But at the same time, I think back and say, you know, not that I would take away anything I was able to do. And, and, and I think that's the part, too, that's made me realize it's 50-50 now. These numbers are important. You still got to get people out. You still got to have natural ability at times, you know, to, to get to that high, high, high level where I was lucky enough to get to. You have to have that natural ability. But to mesh the two is, is, is the key. And that's where I think the, the coach of the future, the coach of the 2020s, is going to be able to understand the data, break the data down understand what it means, help you enhance it, but also help you pitch. You know, having data numbers doesn't mean you can get people out. Uh, getting people out doesn't mean you couldn't enhance your data numbers and be even better. And I, I think there's a fine line between the two right now. And that, that's, that's kind of like my new, my new thought process in both hitting and pitching. And uh, a lot of that I, I caught from, you know, my time, I, I, I kind of lingered around the spikes as I, as I kind of watched my son go through the program last year and become a little bit more involved this year with them, you know, using, using the data to enhance yourself and, and, and become better. My gosh, if I would have had this stuff, I, I, I can confidently say I would have been a better pitcher if I would have had this stuff. Yeah. And, you know, you, you bring a great point. It's that balancing act, right? Like it is, you know, the, the pendulum can swing pretty hard. Right. And, and, and somewhere in the middle there, right. Is that, is that mix between, um, you know, how you use the information and how you blend that with, you know, with, with 
coaching a pitcher, right, or preparing to pitch and everything else that goes into it, to your point, whether it's the raw physical talent. I mean, and, and you know, for those that, that may not know Colin, right, so Colin, you know, is has, has you know, continually progressed to the Astros organization and, and you know, is, I think, you know, we, we hope we're going to see some minor league baseball this year is, is set to start this year in AAA. Um, and, you know, I, I think uh, has really understood like how he uses the data to understand how he wants the ball to spin. He's got a particular target in terms of a spin axis and spin efficiency on almost every single pitch so that he can build, you know, how his curveball moves off how his fastball and his four seamer moves. And he's got a, a profile for, for really, we talk a lot and, and, you know, maybe this is something you have some thoughts on, right? I mean, pitch tunneling is something that has really, you know, kind of come into the forefront over the last few years. And I think data helps inform that because you can really start to understand, like, how can I build the profile of a pitch so that they look, you know, they follow the same track and trajectory for as long as they can before they, they ultimately, you know, break and move at the end and, and just try to keep the hitter off guard as much as they can. So, you know, I mean, is that, is, is tunneling something that you guys, that you've spent some time on? Is it something, I know it's something that Colin's talked about a bit, but just like really understanding the movement profile and what you do to make that happen. Well, I mean, uh, you know, obviously tunneling is important at, at Colin's level. And uh, it can be important at a high school level for somebody that's going to pitch that next. And, and it's really, it's trickling down, right? It's, 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 it's a major league thing. It's a minor league thing now. And it's not, you know, probably I, I would imagine that the college coaches I've talked to too, it's, it's starting to come, come into fruition there. But I, I think the biggest thing to remember too, that, that people forget, like having the ball and, and getting the, getting the consistency with the axis, the spin axis and the spin rate, <laughs> And your, your arm angle, I'll say to my son all the time right now, you know, you're, you're, you're too low. Your arm action's too low right now compared when you throw your change up compared to your fastball, just playing catch. Or when we're long tossing or whatever the case may be. And I think before you can tunnel, that stuff needs to be under control or you're not tunneling. Because tunnel, you know, you, right. you, you need to have that. And I think that's the, the great thing about the Diamond Connects ball is you get that, that access to, to those different things that give you that stuff. So tunneling is another step forward that obviously is huge and big, but I, you know, it's just like with hitting, you know, the one thing I've learned is if you're not moving correctly, then, then when a real pitcher gets in there, if you're not moving yeah. correctly, you aren't hitting the ball. It doesn't matter how good you're hitting off a tee or somebody throwing short toss to you, whatever the case may be. Now what that shows with the, 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 the bat sensor is you have the ability to do that, which is pretty cool. You know, now you got to figure out how to do it in a game Yep. And you have to move correctly or it's not going to matter when that pitcher gets in there and busts you inside or throws it high or whatever the case may be. Kind of goes back to my point of being able to mesh the two. But I think that, you know, it's, it's interesting, like, how, how I've, I've thought about this, you know, over the last two or three months as I've read about it. And, and, you know, the Astros are an organization that's kind of been out in the open about how things have happened. Like, they'll trade for a pitcher and kind of similar to calling, like, they'll trade for a pitcher. And they'll, they'll be like, you're throwing your sinker 70% of the time. And you can find these stories all over the place. And they're like, we don't think it's effective for you. And they use the data, you know, the same data you're getting off of the ball, the either Diamond Connects ball, yeah. or they're getting through Rapsodo or the Diamond Connects ball or whatever the case may be. And they're like, we don't think it's as effective for you. And, and I, you know, I've, I've read some of the comments from some of the pitchers and I, you know, these are big time all-star pitchers and, and, you know, they believe them because they see the track record that they have. And then all of a sudden they go out and see spin rates, this spin rate and spin axis and spin efficiency are these three big words that we could spend 24 yeah. hours talking about on here. And, and I think the one cool thing about spin rate right now is you can look at a guy and, 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 and based on his spin rate, decide the path of the kind of pitcher he may be, you know, the spin rates, you know, at a certain level, well, maybe you should stay and be a sinker baller because in the lower in the zone, it's just the way. But if you have this incredible spin rate and you're not, your, your average velocity is, you know, mediocre or a little bit below, then let's get more to throw in four seamers, getting the better spin rate, getting that, you know, that spin creates that little lift and the, the, the vertical movement of the, uh, the vertical move. I think that's what I'm, I'm saying, it, right? The, the movement up yep. of the ball rather than, working on the side one, it's really, when you look at the data and look at the stats and all these analytics, it's really not doing you as much good as you thought it was doing. And, and it can go the opposite way too. You know that you're not getting enough spin on that ball. You're better off going, get, getting more 
changing that access on the ball because when you have that access change, you get better spin and you get more ground balls out of it. And I think that's the, that's how that is used. It's, it, it, you know, at a younger, younger level, you know, trying to get recruited level, it identifies, you know, strengths and potential abilities and God given talent. Like you just don't make the ball spin 26 right. to 100 RPMs out of the blue. Now you can increase it or you can get better at it. And, and then, you know, to go back to Colin, cause you know, the interesting thing about him is when I first introduced the ball to him, when you gave me one of the first balls that, you know, I could get, you know, I had the first ball, one of the first yeah. balls you tried, I threw. Um, yeah. And and then when you had one of the first ones you were kind of starting to send out before you were doing it to the public, I gave it to him and he would, I was on my phone and he'd throw a pitch. This is how good he's gotten. This is why I think it would have really helped me because I'm very similar in a mindset. He was so good that he'd throw the pitch and say that was like 2,300, wasn't it? And that's I, I, that needs to be twenty three fifty, and I'd look at my phone and be like, "Wow, that's amazing," <laughs> you know, for a young kid. But that's that's what it takes to get good. And I and I think it's I think the 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 cautionary tale is it's all a process. And there's nothing wrong with thinking about the tunneling stuff as a high school player. But I, I think that some of the stuff in that situation, if you aren't good enough of a pitcher, you know, you might be getting a couple steps ahead of the game, and maybe you become yeah. good enough. Of, you know, it's not to say that's not a good thing or a bad thing to do, but maybe you become good enough later and you already, you know, you've already experienced what tunneling is and it can, it can help you out later on. But I think that, you know, as, as advice to somebody, you know, it's, it's use the, use the data when you can, uh, understand it, see how you're improving research, you know, go online, research, find out, you know, and there's, there's, you'll find out there's a lot of bad things online, you know, probably more bad than good. Cause everybody's, you know, doing their own little business of teaching and but but there's a lot of good too and, and yeah. everybody has some kind of good i always say this all the time somebody will ask me what do you think about these people that are giving lessons and this is back when i was playing baseball and, I, and my response always is hey they're giving lessons so they're putting a bat and a ball in somebody's hands to give them extra reps worst case scenario they're getting extra reps and they have a baseball in, in their hand that they wouldn't have in the winter or they wouldn't have in the case may be now we've got this information in front of us and there's a lot of good people out there that are learning and how to use it and what to do with it. And uh, it's just really, you know, it goes, I think each level has a different use for it. Each age group has a different use yep. for it. And, and uh, I'm not an expert on it by any means. I'm trying to get better at it and I'm trying to understand it and, and kind of going through it with my kids as we go along. Yeah, and you make a great point, right? Like there, there's different pur – for, for both on, on both the hitting side and the pitching side, there's different purposes at different levels, right? And, and in many cases in the – you know, as we're talking about younger players and, and younger hitters, and for those of us just, just joining, uh, you know, I'm CJ Handron, uh, the CEO of Diamond Kinetics, and, and you know, thrilled to have our uh, – one of our advisors, Matt Clement, uh, former nine-year big leaguer here with us talking, talking pitching, hitting, basketball. Um, but, you know, the – some of this is, is, is consistency. It's trying to, at the, at the younger levels, just figure out and be able to, to do, to move the right way consistently. Right. And uh, I think that's one of those real areas where data can really inform that. Right. It's hard to feel that sometimes, especially hard as a, as a kid, like I'm, I'm, my kids are 10 and seven. Right. And, and, you know, we're at those beginning points of learning how all of this, how to throw, how to hit, um, it's hard to feel it sometimes. Right. And I think that's where the data can really help, guide that a bit right like it, it the 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 ball and and the the bat sensors you know that they, they they're not worried about feel right like they they measure with precision and so it's it's not that you you know everything has to be you know measured all the time every minute right but it becomes this guiding point that allows you you know and it can be all about consistency first and kind of learning the repeatability of it then it can get into understanding okay well you know now that I know I can spin a ball a certain way on different pitch types, I, I understand what my strengths might be. And then you get into spin access and spin efficiency and you really start having these opportunities to say, well, actually there might be some ways, whether it's in my grip, it's in my release to get more out of what I can do. Right. And I think that, you know, it's it, when it comes to spin, it's all three of those things together. It's not one in a vacuum, you know, if you just have spin rate. Well, that tells part of the story. If you have spin access, it tells part of the story and efficiency tells the third part. So, um, you know, it's, it, it is, it is definitely, uh, you know, a, an interesting, definitely an interesting time, this sort of transitional stage. And, you know, you, you talked about Colin as an example and certainly what you see at, at higher levels, but it's certainly, um, you know, even you know, 
talk about it through the kind of the perspective of your kids, right? Like, do you see as the, you know, the younger generation of kids that are playing now, like, a, um, you know, almost more of a, an interest and an appetite and, and, you know, kind of an expectation that technology is going to be, be there and be able to help them in, in whether it's, you know, pitching, hitting or everything else around them? Well, I think that the kids that are really like, you know, baseball junkies, they're, they're, they're going to gravitate towards it. They're, they're going to be all about it. And, and, and I, and I think that there is a, there is an interest in, and in, you know, that that's, to me, that's really cool because they're seeing it They're you know, shoot, they're putting these things on, on TV when the guys are throwing the pitches or hitting the ball or even on sports center, when they're showing a home run being hit it, it, you know, the metrics of the, the actual hit and, and all that, all those different things. And, you know, with, with my kids, I think it's, you know, and I don't want to repeat myself. I think, you know, to improve some of this stuff, you have to improve how you move. And, and so we, we really, you know, to me, we're, you know, my, my second one is, is, is a pitcher and he's only a freshman and, and we're worried about how he's moving. And, and my other one, you know, and all three of them, we're worried about how they're, you know, how they're moving when they swing because that's going to help produce that, you know, and I think the tough thing is you don't, you know, you can go to a big league and you can get stats out there and there's guys throwing 88 miles an hour with 2,600 mile spin rates. And there's guys throwing, you know, 95 with not as much, but that just means yeah. they don't have that hop or that little rise on the ball at the end. And, and the way you can maybe make it more consistent, enhance it, everything else is by the way you move. So it's, it's a trust in the people that are teaching it to you, teaching you how to move correctly. And, and, you know, that's, that's what I focus on, you know, with, with all the kids that I, that I'm around. And, uh, you know, I think the, the, you, if you don't move correctly, if you don't have the right arm path, like I think one of the big things Colin did that really increased his velocity, which increased his spin rate. And I've seen this, you know, numerous times in stories on social media stuff, big leaguers talking, you know, he, he shortened his arm path up instead of making it long. And, and, you know, you can, it can be as simple as making sure you're getting behind the ball and not getting around it. We all, yeah. you know, when kids are young, they throw the ball <coughs> and, and they get on the side of it. They, they, they get their hand yeah. on the side of the ball. I'm a little close on my screen here. And that creates side spin. And, and one of the, you know, I, one thing for sure is I don't, I'm not going to criticize how anybody's teaching or doing what they're doing. Cause everybody's in this experiment and trying to figure things out. But one of the reasons, you know, I don't like to teach cutters to young kids is is because I and, and I've actually read some of the predominant experts like in the major league field have said this and made me feel better about my thought process is, you know, you, a cutter is you get your hand around the ball and kind of cut the ball. So it kind of gets some sideways spin on it where to get that great spin rate, you need to be behind the ball and, and you want to be behind the ball and getting that that four seam action and getting as much spin on it. So what, what starts to happen is it starts to morph the two together. And I, I actually, you know, I break my career down into different phases, you know, getting there, survival, uh, <laughs> figuring it out, but I couldn't get left-handers out. Uh, maybe on my way out, okay, I'm going to add a cutter. And, and that cutter, when I added that cutter, like I went from a guy that had a great sinker, they couldn't throw my sinker anymore because mm. of the cutter. Now some, the, the great, great, great Hall huh. of Famers and all the training that everybody's doing now, it's a different time are able to do both. It's not impossible, but yeah. for a young kid, it's hard who's, to, who's already thrown, a, thrown with a little side spin on the ball to add a cutter. And, and, and I, I say this all the time with all these different pitches with the young kids, I'm not opposed to it. If your mechanics are good, I'm not opposed to the different pitches, but, but the worry is you morph them together and that you have to have that. You want to have that, that true fastball the best you can, whether it be a sinker or whatever the case may be that has that, good spin access and whatever the case may be. And I, you can add, I tell the young ones all the time, because I'd say, well, you threw a cutter. I mean, my mm -hmm. son said it to me, you threw a cutter, you threw a slider. Why can't I? And, and, I, and my comment always is for somebody that would be asking that question is, let's, let's figure out how to get people out without it. And yeah. then when you add it, it's going to make you even better. It's a real weapon and, at and, that and point. And when you feel like you can't get people out anymore, okay, maybe we better at it. You know, if you want to yep. be a pitcher and still survive. So, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, there's, it's, it's such a great topic and the, the, the information that, you know, the diamond kinetics and, and, and provides and, and the world provides now with baseball yeah. it just opens up this gigantic box and, and it gives these kids, especially like I, you know, like I started this portion with the baseball junkies, it gives them the chance to really dive in and understand yeah. and, and make themselves better, you know, 
take take away the quarantine my comment about the yeah. quarantine how to get ahead of people you can get ahead of people on the side or, or what you're doing but a lot of it's going to come down I, I i keep going back this is how you move it's, yep. it's, it's how you, if you can't move correctly you can't produce it and if you produce it moving incorrectly you're going to have a tough time doing it consistently yeah. and uh, that's probably one of the things that's come out of this whole thing for me this kind of you know seeing all this stuff in action yeah you know and, and um you know that that's a uh, you're you're spot on right and and you know you know what what i think's been been you know so cool about all this right is that um you know, you, you actually really have developed this product with us, right? Like you, you did have the very first one of these in your hands. Um, you know, you, um, we, we went through about a year where uh, you were there every Thursday for the, uh, the, the touch base meeting on the development of pitch tracker and, and providing input along the way. Right. And, and now, you know, I, I think we're, we're really keen on, on how the body moves and, and ways that we can start to kind of connect the dots together with the data we collect with the ball and how you understand how the body moves. So it's, you're, you're absolutely spot on. Um, I want to be respectful of your time. So I'll, I'll, I'll take us towards the finish line here, but um, you know, let's talk a little bit uh, on the big league level here. Right. So, you know, I'm going to put you back in your, back in your playing days shoes here, right? And, and you know, use the word unprecedented, right? Which this certainly is. And, and there's not something to be able to relate it to, right? Because nobody's gone through this. But, you know, what's, what would be going through your head at this point? Like, how do you, you know, how do you stay prepared? How, how are guys, you know, that you stay in touch with now, you know, that are, are going through this? And how, 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 do you, how do you handle this, right? Like, what, what, would, you, what would you be doing? Uh, well, you know, it's really, it would really be different because, you know, you, you understand what an off season is, you understand what preparing is, but you're three weeks into spring training, yeah. really ramping up to get your last couple starts as a starting pitcher or a hitter getting all those reps and then boom, it's gone. And, uh, you know, f for me, I, I developed over the time I played and one of the things that drove me was like a guilty conscious of, I got to I got to do my work. And if it was nine o'clock at night and I hadn't done whatever it may be, you know, my, my shoulder program or my, my lifting, whatever that day or running on a treadmill, I was going down to do it. Or if I didn't the next day, I was doing twice as much with the running or whatever the case may be. And I think for me and my perspective, I'd be, I'd be looking at it the same way I, I told my, my uh, high school players, you know, there's going to, there's going to be some people that, that, you know, when I played in the big leagues, I had to do that to survive. If I wouldn't have done that, uh, I wouldn't have survived. I wouldn't have lasted. That's how I kept myself there. But, you know, I think it would have been a situation where I would have kind of been a little panicky about it because I wouldn't want to lose what I had, especially if things were going well in spring training. Um, and, and just have yourself in a situation, you know, I, I, would, I would look at it as I need to be ready in two weeks. You know, the day they yeah. say, and, and it's got to be, I got to be at the same spot here or a little better. I don't want to, you know, I, I, I probably need to be a little bit more ramped up than I'd be a little bit more ramped up towards game competition than I needed to be because I'd rather be more that way than less that way. Than trying to and, catch up, yeah. And, you know, so from a, a perspective of a, of a, a you know, a, a former player, you know, I would be, you know, I know it's hard. One of the hardest things to buy right now is weight equipment online. I found out yeah. myself. <laughs> buying, but but I, I would have been going and getting it wherever I needed to get it, get it in my house and continued on my program or whatever the case may be. And, and in today's day and age, you know, they aren't completely blind. Like when I was going through this, I would have been blind with a couple of emails, a couple of workout yep. programs. They, they, they get on, they can get on FaceTime with, with their, with their hitting coach and hit or throw a bullpen with their pitching coach stand, sitting right there watching it and taking a step further that, you know, a lot of them probably have access to whether it be a diamond kinetics ball, yeah, whether it be a, a, a rap soda or a track man or whatever the case may be, you know, they, they're, they have enough, money that they have all the resources in the world to be able to do this. And I think the majority of them are able to do that and send the data and see the data. And, and a lot of them, I would guess at this point in the big leagues from the people I've talked to, the ones that have really thrived on it, understand it. So they can look at it, see it, whatever the case may be. So, you know, I, I think it would be normal getting ready, probably a little bit of panic and uneasiness in there, just not knowing what's going on. I'd try to, I guess the one thing I'd try to do is put out of my mind that we might not play this year, because if you do that, you kind of, you know, it, psychologically, you lose that edge. That yeah. would be one thing that I would probably go away from and uh, do everything I can that when I came back, I wasn't going to get hurt. When I showed up, they weren't going to say, hey, he wasn't ready or he didn't do anything during this time off. He, he, he did his thing. He was ready to go and, and he, he's ready to, you know, do his thing. I, I watched a couple of the 
the Korean baseball league. Yeah, I did too. <laughs> uh, you know, and I, and I listened to Adam Jones talk about it last night. He did a great interview, and, I, and Eric Thames the other night did a, a phenomenal interview. What a great guy. And those two yeah. guys were just phenomenal personalities. And, and they talked about it a little bit too, being over there, you know, they one's overseas in Japan now, and, and obviously Eric's in, in, with, the, with the Nationals now. And just talking about the stuff they're doing and trying to stay prepared and being ready to go. And, and uh, it's, it's, it's really interesting. Yeah, it is for sure. You know, and, and, you know, you, you're, you, you bring it up, right. And it's super relevant for, for us as a company. We've seen this happen at, at, at all kinds of levels, right. With everything we've been doing with play at home, right. Technology does enable that. Right. So we have, you know, we have young teams, we have collegiate teams, you, you know, that can use this as a way to be able to, um, to stay connected, you know, to be able to try to stay on top of things, to see how, you know, put some programs together, keep hitting, keep throwing. So, um, you know, I do think that is a, that is a real thing. And it's a, it's a difference in, in this time versus, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, all right. So I'll, I'll wind this down here and I'm going to, I'm going to weave in a couple of the questions that popped up in kind of a, a little sort of closing rapid fire here. Right. So, um, and I'm just going to rattle through, you know, we'll go, we'll go quick, quick answer kind of thing here. So um, what's the, do, do you have a, like a, a biggest moment on the mound that, that kind of stood out for you? What do you have something that sticks with you as that memory of like at, you know, in your, during your career, that's like, ah, that was, that was that the biggest moment. You know, I never really thought about that. And then, Last week, uh, the Cubs were the Cubs were broadcasting their top games of the 2000s, and there was like yeah. seven games. And I and the second game was the when we clinched the division. I pitched a game, and it was a it was a crazy scenario. We went into the game, uh, you know, the Astros were playing two that day. We were playing two that day. The only way we could clinch the division was if they <laughs> lost both and we won both. And fortunately, in the long and I was pitching game two of it. And um, fortunately, we were in a, a rain delay looking back on it now. So the Astros played their – they were done with their second game before our first one was over. They were both day games. And uh, it was in Wrigley Field, and they – and the Astros lost both. The uh, uh, Mark Pryor pitched when my, my good friend pitched, and, and he won the he, he, he won the first one. So put me in a spot where – it was against the Pirates, which didn't matter at that point. I, I pitched yeah. against the Pirates enough times that my hometown team wasn't – it wasn't yeah. that unbelievable of a thing. Um, but, you know, if I won that game, we clinched the division. And I, and I didn't realize at the time the Cubs hadn't, I believe, hadn't cl clinched anything on Wrigley Field since 1945. Wow. Um, and they played the game. And it was really interesting because when I, when I watched the game and I pulled it up on YouTube and watched it, and it, it was like a four-hour broadcast because they did all the celebrating at the end. I never watched the celebration at the end. I pitched <laughs> good, fortunately – had a good day, won the game. We clinched the division. There was cool shots of my wife and my oldest son, who was a, a baby at the time, on the yeah. field with me after the game and just with my old friends and running around and kind of like doing a victory lap with all the fans and, you know, all that stuff and all the interviews and stuff. And, and I, I look back and what, what a great, great moment because I, I, I love my time in Chicago. I love, my, I love my time in the big leagues. If you didn't, you're crazy. If you played yeah. and didn't love your time. But I really love my time in Chicago and, and that goal. And, and unfortunately, you know, a couple of series later, we had a disappointing loss in game seven to the Marlins and didn't get to the World Series that year. But, you know, that game, being the guy that was on the field and clinched that game and just doing it with my teammates and they were all good friends of mine and some still are, was, was probably my one moment. Now you gave me something to go hunt down and watch uh, <laughs> later tonight. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, what was your favorite ballpark to pitch in? Um, to pitch in, I, I love PNC Park, and I know that's kind of a homer statement. I just I remember the first time I pitched in Three Rivers, I think two times. Somebody asked me that the other day. I think it was two times. And then when I remember the first time coming back to PNC, I just I just think they did it's just such a fabulous job yeah. on it. It's just a great park. And you know, a little biased because I got to come home and sleep in my own bed and have a lot of my friends and family around during it. Uh, you know, as far as I, I kind of split it to newer and older, and and you know, Wrigley is my favorite field. Yeah. And, and and I and I call it, you know Wrigley isn't necessarily older anymore as they've done all the improvements, but it, you know it, it just just the atmosphere and the the the, the fans and the, the you know I, I went to Boston and was able to be a part of the second World Series there the new new era, but and and I got to Boston the year after they won that first one, so there was an expectation there, 
and and the Cubs were still so hungry and so wanted it, and and like like the whole thing revolved around what was going on with them when we got in that pennant race on you know as the same year of that game that that we, we kind of jumped in unexpectedly and uh so i just love pitching at wrigley field i i hated day games so i got there i u- i tried to use it to my advantage and plan my sleep patterns on the road to be ready to pitch in those games and uh and uh, try you know trending pattern <laughs> of me trying to figure things to use to my advantage but um <laughs> you know kept me in the league and uh really enjoyed that place it's awesome um toughest hitter you ever faced you know the the I'll go two here also. Uh, yep. the, the one guy I really had trouble with early on was Todd Helton. Uh, he seemed to he seemed to really have my number. And left-handers did a better job against me in general than right-handers earlier on. When I figured out how to get lefties out, I I kind of got a little revenge on him later on. But he still had, he way <laughs> had the upper hand. And I used to I used to get frustrated. I'd get him on a check swing, and he'd still hit the you know the swinging bunt to to third base and still get a hit out of it, even when I when I fooled him. But that definitely the toughest hitter I faced. Not even a question not even close as Barry Bonds, uh, you know, just a phenomenal talent, um, you know, at a time where you know, the things that stand out to me, the couple of things that stand out to me going through it was he had such a command of the strike zone. Um, and he also, you know, deservingly so, this was a time before all the, the strike zone things were on the TV and some pitchers got bigger strike zones and <laughs> some didn't and some hitters got smaller strike zones. And he was, he was one that, because of what he did, and he deserved it. I'm not complaining about it. He deserved it. But the one thing you could do is, you know, one one place that you could try to go in there and you, you kind of had to establish at some point was into him, but he was like one of the only left-handers that could keep the inside pitch, even off the plate, fair. You know, a lot of guys, you throw it in there and they still they, they crush it. Yank it, yeah. 600 feet foul for a foul ball home run. It's just, a, you know, maybe that sets up your next pitch. But with Bonds, he, he had the danger of he could keep it fair and – uh just, just in the command of the strike zone, didn't swing at balls, and and to go along with how great of a hitter he was. Well, that's awesome, man. Well, listen, I I want to thank you so much for spending you know spending the time, kind of talking uh, all the way around everything from you know high school to baseball to basketball to everything in between. It's been a ton of fun. Uh, we love working with you and, and everything that you've been able to do to to help us, you know, as, um, as we understand what we can do, you know, with technology. And so I uh, hope everybody stays safe and well, and uh, we'll look forward to, to having you back down at the office when we're all uh, able to get back there. So thanks, Matt. I really appreciate it. And thanks everybody for, uh, for joining us tonight. It hey, sounds good. Thank you for having me. And I would, I would encourage kids be, you know, dive into that information, figure it out, watch videos, watch all the stuff on social media and, and find out what's good. That's awesome. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Good night.